everyone welcome to the well oasis international sunday um, service this is um the main service and today we're going to be continuing on our series on abiding if you just give me a moment to finish my housekeeping i'll be right with you our father and our king the god of heaven we glorify your name this afternoon we thank you for the opportunity to interact with your word again father word we are submitting to whatever your spirit will have for us today we ask that you prepare our hearts so good and that as we speak to us we will hear you and we will receive that which you say to us father lord at the end of today let men be blessed let women be blessed let children be blessed but more importantly oh god may we take instructions by which we would move our lives forward in the name of jesus thank you god of heaven in jesus mighty name Amen. Good evening. Welcome. Um, we are looking at abiding part number 11. Last week we looked at abiding part 10 and um, our theme was branch in, branch out. Essentially we were saying that every man, every new believing priest must branch into God to be able to branch out to the world. That God has created us and called us to the place where we would minister our, our ministry is twofold we minister to him and then we minister to the people we minister to him by intercession and we minister to the uh, but to him by worship rather and we minister to him by intercession today we want to continue that um the series on abiding and this is our penultimate one i decided i'll round it off at 12 um 12 installments so this is installment number 11 and our theme is isolate and die isolate and die we're going to be shifting our focus a bit away from having to abide in god to abiding together having to uh, abide in god to abiding together because here's the point of today's um, message if you like um, as long as you are able to abide with god you, your, or your abiding with God is not complete. We actually started that conversation last week. Your abiding in God is not complete if you cannot abide with people. We were created for community. The Bible says it like this. Do not forsake the assembly of the brethren together. Now, before now, we used to think that the assembling of the brethren together had to be that we will be in one room lifting our hands and lifting our voices to worship. But if there is anything that God has taught us in this season, it is the fact that you don't have to be in the same room to abide together. But as great as technology and everything is that have, um, have allowed us the opportunity to be able to worship together and do life together, even while social distancing for now, or physically distancing, as, um, distancing for now, is that in that same place is a place where a man can quickly fall into the place of isolation. And isolation leads to death. One of the first things I learned as a believer growing up is that um, isolation is the first step to destruction. That every time the devil wants to deal with a man and take him out, the devil will isolate the man. He will cause the man to isolate himself 
And before you know what is happening, what you begin to find is that the man begins to die because he's not getting his sustenance. Now, there is a lot of Christianese, that is Christian language, for when people decide to isolate themselves. Today, our focus is not on the devil isolating us. Our focus is in us trying to isolate ourselves. And I'll come to that very quickly. But if you follow me to the illustration of last week, looking at the branch and looking at the, uh, uh, at least looking at the tree and looking at the branches, I'm telling, and, and, and I remember that at some point I did say that it is impossible for a branch to bear fruit unless it is attached to the tree, that every branch that is cut off from the tree begins to die. The moment it is cut off from the tree, the, the journey of death begins for it. So there is a need to remain attached if you will be that person who will continue to bring forth fruit. Now let's imagine a branch who decides, or a branch that decides that, well, <coughs> while I'm attached to the vine, I do not like my leaves. And because I don't like my leaves, I have made up my mind that I will not allow any leaf to grow on me. Neither would any stem come out of me. So you have a branch that is really clean, really healthy, taking all the sustenance for itself. It is really robust. The problem is it has no stems and so there is and no leaves and therefore there is no way that um, flowers would happen or flowering will happen and ultimately fruiting would come. So you will have a really healthy branch that is not fulfilling purpose. Sometimes life can make us, as Christians, life can make us become that kind of branch where things happen around us and especially when you have to go and worship with people and you have to serve this God with people. People do things to us that make us want to isolate ourselves from them. Many years ago, not many years ago, about three years ago, I was on a trip in the States and someone said to me, and she said to me, she came to see me and we we're having a conversation. And she said, oh, there's something I really admire about you. And I said, what? And she said, you are very confident. I couldn't stop laughing. I could not stop laughing because what she saw as confidence was timidity redefined. I had to sit her down to say to her, oh, no, I'm not as confident as you think. For a very long time, I was one of the most timid people you would ever have come across. That it is community to have found myself in, a, in relationships that were empowering, relationships that were enabling, relationships that were validating, is how I grew confidence. So no, I wasn't always a confident person. And I remember that I told Darrell that that time. About 25 years ago, I found myself in church. And of course, if you're in church, you will find yourself with people. And what happened was that people hurt me. But because I was immature, I interpreted it as church hurt me. So people in church hurt me, but I took it out on church. And I decided that I would have nothing to do with church again. So my plan was never to go to church again. And my plan was never to have anything to do with anybody that find, calls themselves a member of a church again. And I succeeded for a while until life happened again. And I had to move in with my uncle. And in the place of moving in with my uncle, when I moved in with my uncle, what I now realized was that my uncle was not going to take no for an answer. My uncle was a pastor. And um, my uncle decided, as long as you lived under my uncle's roof, you must, and I say it again, you must go to church. He doesn't care whether church hurt you. He doesn't care whether church killed you and you're almost dead. As long as you lived in his house, you would go to church. And in that place, because I, my father had said that he would not let me come back to Lagos, this is the abridged version. If I did not move in with my uncle, I had to move in with my uncle. And my uncle, his rules were not plenty, but his major rule was you must go to church. If you can sleep through it, it's not his problem. But you must come to church. But the thing was, I thought, okay, maybe if I went to church, I could sleep through it. With my uncle, you can't sleep through it because he'll be parabolated. He'll be coming to check you from time to time whether you are engaged in, in what is happening or not. Long and short of the matter is that because of his insistence, I went back to church with him. And I'm grateful to God that I went back to church with him. Because it was in going back to that church that I got nurtured. It was in going back to that church that I grew. It was in going back to that church that 
I met my husband. It was in going back to that church that um, I found a man with the spirit and the heart of a father who not only nurtured us, but he was the one that put oil on me and released me to ministry. My point is, when life happens to you and people hurt you in a church environment, the tendency is we want to leave church. And today's gist, or the gist of today's uh, message is that if you leave your enabling and empowering environment, if you leave the body, because the body of Christ, the believers are the body of Christ, and that means that you are a part of a body. If you decide that because of the things they've done to you, you leave, you are the one that will die. So let's just get it out there. So in this place, I was nurtured, I grew, I found my call, and, I, and since then I have grown and I have continued to grow. What that experience taught me was that life would definitely happen. People would do things to me, but the church and the people are not the same thing. And, you know, as I thought about it and as I've grown and as I've understood this thing, we go to offices where 80% of the people don't like us. They don't treat us well. They backbite. They gossip. They undercut us. I don't hear people getting up and leaving. Leaving their jobs because somebody hurts them at work. They come back to work and even when sometimes they are the same team, they're in the same team and they do the work and they deliver on the job. And when you ask them, they say, well, I'm at work and I'm doing my work. I didn't go there for them. Why is it that it's only in church? The pastor's wife didn't smile to you. You leave. The pastor used a, an illustration and it sounds like you. You leave. They ask, they have a building fund and they ask you to contribute, you leave. You don't dress decently, you come, they say to you, oh, this does not befit a child of God in dressing, you leave. We ought to think down and ask ourselves, why is it that the first um, decision or the first solution to any um, hurt in church is that I'm leaving? And the answer is simple. Every time that happens and you leave, the devil has you exactly where he wants you. He will take you out. He will keep you somewhere where you, nobody is talking to you. If you like work with your head, nobody is ans asking you any questions. And before you know it, he has fed you fat enough. He slaughters. So isolation is something that believers have to be very careful about. Because there is no way you will abide in the vine, Jesus Christ, and you would isolate yourself from other branches. Because if you, we go back to that example of the clean branch that I gave and said he didn't want leaves, doesn't like the smell of the flowers that come out of it, if the buds don't look nice enough, every time, every single time that happens, the branch is exactly clean but bare. Because what makes a branch produce, it's only a branch that can produce, hold, and sustain leaves that can ultimately produce, hold, and sustain fruit. So I want you to keep that page, that picture in front of you as we go on into these things that we're talking about. For you to recognize that we are part of a body. If you go with me for, to 1 Corinthians chapter number, it wasn't the scripture I wanted to start with, but we might as well go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's a long scripture. We read verse 4 to 7 and then 15 to 26. But I won't read all of it. In verse 4 it says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man. To profit with that. Let's quickly go to verse number 15. It says, If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ears shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole, he if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God has set the members, every one of them in the body, as it had pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now there are many members, yet one body. You can read in your spare time all the way to the end. 
The point is, when God fashioned us and put us in the body, we all had different things that we bring to the body. There is the man whose job is to bring a teaching. He's a, he has the skill or the grace of a teacher. There is the man whose job is to question and question and question everything. Why he can be annoying sometimes to those of us that just want to do, sometimes he's the reason why we are sick. He's the reason why we don't get in trouble because he's consistently asking questions. Everyone has a gift and that is why in the body we are fused together. So if someone comes and says, oh, because the church hurts me, I am no longer going to church again. Why do you think you are doing the pastor? Can I announce that you are doing yourself? Oh, Because the one that is at risk of dying is the one that leaves his sustenance behind simply because it's like they cooked you a pot, a, a pot of beans. You really like beans and they cooked you a pot of beans. And you took the first spoonful and you saw one weevil. And you take the entire pot, and it's your last pot of food in the house. In these days of lockdown, you take the entire pot and you upend it into the, 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 the trash can. Who goes hungry? So when I'm talking about isolating and dying, there are many ways that people isolate themselves. If you go with me to Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 1. Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 1. It says, he that separated himself seeketh his own desire, and rageth against all sound wisdom. This is the ASV um, version, the American Standard Version. In the Amplified, it says, He who willfully separates himself from God and man seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. And in the English Standard Version, it says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all all sound judgment every single time we isolate ourselves because we're abiding right so it's great to abide in the vine but if you are not if the branch is saying i don't want to have anything to do with the roots the branch is going to die because the root is the one that finds the water if the root is saying well i will just be bringing water i don't have to want to have anything to do with the with the branch then what's going to happen is the roots would implode because it will store the water in itself and not find anyone take the water from it. So when a man says, oh, I'm isolating myself, and we have all kinds of Christian words to use, and I'm going to get to that. What you find is that that man, the Bible says, when a man separates himself from the body, his desire is raging. There is something, he has an agenda that he wants to fulfill. Most of the time, when I don't want to be part of the body, it's because I don't want to be accountable. Because, yes, not everyone knows how to correct people and correct them in love. I don't think I'm not one of the ones who knows how to correct people in love every time. I, mean, I don't think I'm that one. But the tendency to leave is risky, and that's what we are looking at today. So thankfully, 25 years ago, even though I left a particular place, my uncle made sure he took me back and plugged me in church. Because that was where I found community. It was right in that church that I got my first job after all that life had dealt me. And since then, I have grown and I have grown and I have grown and I have grown. So every one of us needs to find our place in the body. That's what today's conversation is about. If you open with me to Psalm 68, Psalm number 68, I want to show us something. Psalm 68 from verse 1 to verse 6. Psalm 68 from verse 1 to verse 6. It says, let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melted before the fire, so let the wicked perish as the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let him rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. In verse number 6, which is the verse that I'm really interested in, it says, God set up the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains. But the rebellious dry in a dry land, a dwell in a dry land. God sets the solitary, the lonely, the one who is alone. He takes him. The, punch, the, the point of the body of Christ is that when God sees a man, and, or when God cleans, 
brings a man to himself and cleans him up. He plants him within a body because he knows that that man does not have everything that he needs for himself, number one. And he knows that that man has something that someone else needs. So he brings us into the body and it is in that place of rubbing each other off that we begin to get to the place that we need to go. That's how we begin to get to the place that we need to go. If you open with me to Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs 27. Verse number 17. It says, Iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens the countenance of his brother. There is all of his friend. There is a need. Is iron is sharpening iron. What happens when two irons rub themselves against each other? Is that they become sharpened together. Both of them become sharpened together. Both of them become sharpened together. So when you are in a body of Christ, or you are in the body, you've been planted in a specific place in the body, isolation is deadly for you, for yourself only, not for the other person. What, is to, what does the word isolate mean? Isolate is to separate something from other things with which it is connected or mixed. So isolate is to keep a person or animal separate from other people or animals by putting them in a different place. We were created for community. And no matter what happens, we ought to keep community going. We ought to keep community going. We ought to keep community going because that is how we are able to produce and produce properly. Today, people have blessed me already. People have sent me messages, oh, happy Mother's Day. I didn't even know it was Mother's Day. So me too, I now started to wish people Mother's Day because there are many Mother's Days out there. Sometimes you, you don't even know which one is which. So all the mothers this afternoon, I wish you a happy Mother's Day. But the point is that someone remembered me. Some said a really great prayer that made, you know, gladdened my heart. Not that they, it's not any other thing other than the fact that, as we will say, we they use, how do they talk for those state that time? Make, we use body to rub body, just so that we find warmth. The Ecclesiastes says it like this, it says two are better than one. To isolate yourself is to get yourself in trouble. When a man isolates himself, two things you can deduce is, number one, he's seeking his own desire. Number two, he's bound to shun wise counsel. There's nothing you can tell a man who seeks to isolate himself that he does not have Christianity to cover it. There is a spirit that bets isolation, and it is a spirit of loneliness. And I used to think that loneliness happens when you are alone. But what I have found is that loneliness can happen in Osho the market. I mean, you can be in a crowd. And everyone is milling around you. You are even talking to them. They are responding to you. And yet you are lonely. And as long as you allow loneliness to become your focus, what begins to happen is you begin to hear voices. You begin to hear voices. No one cares about you. They don't love you. And all of that, and all of that, and all of that. After, one, after a while, you just find yourself saying, if I'm even here, nobody cares about me. Nobody needs me. Nobody loves me. Nobody dates. Nobody doubts. Let me leave. And in leaving, people get in major trouble. In major trouble. You should never isolate because of accountability. The Bible says if one falls, the other would raise him. You should never isolate because you are not, um, what's the word? You are not a repository of all wisdom. Other people can bring wisdom into your life. I know some people are saying, but you know, I have, I'm not isolated though. I'm connected to other Christians. And I say, what is their name? They say, this pastor and that pastor on YouTube. That's rubbish. You, when you, all you do is do it on social media or do it online, then of course they can't offend you because if the pastor preaches something you are not comfortable with, what do you do? You change the channel. You don't listen to them again. You tune off. That's how we begin to get selective hearing and we are not pushing ourselves into truth anymore. Isolation will push you one step away 
And most of the time, we have Christianese for this. It's Christianese that we have is, I need time to reflect. Someone said that to me a few years ago, and I laughed in French. I need time to reflect. And I was wondering, what are you reflecting on? Then another one you hear is, I am praying. What are you praying about? <laughs> then another one says, I need time with God. The problem is that in that time, especially if you ask those who truly take a time with God, what happens is they go and they minister to God, and God gives them something to come out to the body for. So when you say, I need time with God, and is it extended and extended, is one month, is six months, is one year, is three years, is six years, you've never been to church. What has happened to you is that you've started to isolate. And if you begin to take a look at yourself, you will begin to do the things you weren't doing before. Why? Because where you go to get divine intervention in your life, where you get to go to get divine instructions, you are no longer interacting with those people. And so you find yourself deteriorating until one day, God forbid, you are dead. You say, I'm not dead, I'm still alive, I've not been going for seven years. That's the problem. You are so dead, you don't even know you are dead. Because you are thinking, well, why do I need to go? Isolation is the first step to destruction. As a priest in the new covenant, my response to loneliness isn't to exclude myself. My response to loneliness is to plug myself into a group. Now, I always tell people, and I know those who belong to really big churches will think I'm beefing them. Please, I'm not beefing you. You can belong to a really big church. Make sure you plug into a small group. Because in my experience, growth doesn't happen in Dubai Market. Because nobody knows you are there. Nobody knows when you come. Nobody cares when you don't come. That's why every mega church has a cell system. Well, not every. Most of them have a cell system. The idea is there must be somewhere where they know you. They know your address. They know your nuances. They know your weaknesses. There must be someone within your environment that knows you enough. Isolation is the first step to destruction. Why do people isolate themselves? Number one, someone hurts me. Offense. What does the Bible say about offense? Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs 18 verse 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Can you see that? Someone hurts me, so they carry offense. And because of offense, they leave. Piling nonsense on top of nonsense. Number two, people live because they feel they are not useful. And the reason why you feel you are not useful, where God has planted you, is because you are actually looking to be used in a certain way. And you see, when you belong in a body and that body has leadership, it is their prerogative where they want to deploy you. If God told you to stay there, your job is to stay there. When it is time, the Lord will move their hearts to recognize you. But until that happens, you don't come and say, where, where I was coming from, I was the chief bishop and pope. And here I get here, they just say, good morning, brother, and they let me be. You get angry and you go where they didn't ask you to go. Or you even go home and you don't go at all. You say, you know what, I will just be doing my own now. Gets you in trouble. Number three re reason why people isolate themselves is because they feel they are not needed. They get there, they say, oh, the church is really top heavy. There's a lot of people there. People at every department have a duplication and a duplication. There is absolutely nothing I can do there, so I'm not required. Because we can't see what we have is the reason why we believe that no one needs us. Why does someone need to need me in front if I'm not called to the front yet? Why can't I just be, why can't it just be that it's the person that sits beside me every time that I come that I get to touch their lives? Why does it have to be a title? Isolation is a first step to destruction. Then the fourth reason, and this is one that is very prevalent in today's present day body of Christ. They don't owe, uh, they owe me mentality. Can you imagine? I'm the one that gives the largest tithe in that church. Yet when I come, the pastor will just say good morning and walk past. What do you want the pastor to do?
to do a somersault because you gave you pay tithes to your father. How about you? <laughs> how about you continue to come and don't pay the tithes? We had a situation like that many years ago. Someone came. We were just setting up and came, and he became part of the leadership. He would beat his wife on Saturday and come to church on Sunday and come to preach. And then after one day, I don't know what happened. I think nobody even told us he was beating on his wife. That's what we found out later, later, later. But I think it was in the course of preaching, somebody touched on you. If you are a wife basher, you are not a Christian. He got upset and left. First Sunday, second Sunday, third Sunday, fourth Sunday. So I said to my husband, Shabi, they say you are a pastor and I'm a pastor's wife. Let's go and visit him and ask him what it is. We got there and he said, you know, Pastor Mark, I saw you as a young man that had been given an assignment that you may not have the financial resources to carry. So I thought, let me come and give you some financial muscle. So apparently he felt that because he was given money, and the funny thing is that he was not given financially more than we were, we were because we were given all that we had. It was a widow's might, but it was all that we had. And he, when he finished, he says, so, you know, you know, I guess he was expecting that we'll begin to beg that day because he was telling us that he had a lot more money to give to us. We finished and we got in the car and we left. And I said to my husband, if he comes again, he can't even come in. Because I am now going to pray that he stays out. And if this church will collapse with his mo without his money, then the church needs to collapse quickly so that we know what we're doing. People come and they have that mentality. Someone owes me. I am the one that does it. I am the one that knows how to pray the most. How dare they ask Antonia to pray now? <laughs> Some of I have been in a church, and I'm not joking, where someone came to church at 10 a.m., marched to the front, tapped on somebody who came at 8 a.m. and said, that is my seat, get up. And when they told her, sister, that's not the way it is done, she got angry and she left church. My point is the reasons that we isolate are not really nice, really nice reasons. So we may have a spiritual term for them, but they are not nice. Now someone will say, but what if I, I went on to another church? Make sure that the place you are living was not the place God told you to stay. That's all I'm saying. I have a rule at the well and in all the ministries the Lord has helped, helped me lead over time. If you don't come, first Sunday I would imagine that maybe you are not well. So I will ask, are you not well? And I will not ask you directly, I will ask your friend, whoever I know you are close to, what's with this person? I say, oh no, she went somewhere, okay. Second Sunday, third Sunday, I, if I still don't see you consecutively, I will ask you, are you okay? If you say to me, you are okay, then I don't ask you again. No. Periodically, I can send you a message, I hope you are well, but I don't ask you, why are you not coming to church? Because I wasn't there when you start, made up your mind to come. So if you decide that you are leaving, what I'm just saying is before you get up away, Make sure God told you. Make sure God told you. There was a research, a research that was done about 10 years ago. I'm sure if they did it now, it's even worse. And they said a, every believer, a, an adult believer in their lifetime, would have attended eight churches in their lifetime. And my question is, what did you lose that you are looking for? It's not like you are changing cities. In the same city, sometimes in the same neighborhood, people will attend eight churches. Kill on share, what is wrong with you? The devil is just looking for a way to cut you off. Cut you off from discipline. Cut you off from questioning. Cut you off from accountability. Cut you, cut you off from your sustenance, the word, so that he can finish you. Isolation is the first step towards destruction. So somebody says, Tabi, get to, the, get to nice scriptures. These ones are not nice. Okay, so let's go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 4. Let us read verse number 4. 2 Samuel chapter 4. Excuse me. Verse number 4. And Jonathan saw son, had a son that was lame of the feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul 
and Jonathan out of Israel. And his, son, his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Let's go to the same Second Samuel chapter 9. Second Samuel chapter 9, from verse 1 to 13. So you know the story of Mephibosheth, right? Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son, who was lame in, the feet, in his feet because he had an accident when they were trying to flee after his father and his grandfather were killed in battle and he was, they were, his nurse was carrying him to, ru to run away to keep him safe probably. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, David, and David said, I'm reading from verse 1, Is there yet anyone, any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Micah, the son of Amir in Lodabar. Then the king sent, King David sent, and they fetched him out of the house of Micah, the son of Amir from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all, unto thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Mephibosheth was a prince. If his father had become king, he would have become the next king after Jonathan. And now because of an accident that took him out of his environment and his vicinity and all, all that he was, see how he now saw himself. A dead dog. He's not even a dog in his own eyes. He's a dead dog. God's goal is to put you in a family. Mephibosheth was cut off he couldn't have thought that there was anything left in his life. Because he was lame. But David restored him. And regardless of his limitation, at the end of the story, he was restored to the wealth that he was born in. If you read that story to the end, part of what Mephibosheth got back was that because Mephibosheth was lame and he couldn't do anything for himself, which isolated him, Ziba, his father's servant, took over everything that he had. So Ziba had grown and he had over 20 men servants. He had land all over the place. Imagine, that was classical. The, the, beg, the prince was begging and the beggar was riding. So what David did when Mephibosheth got plugged back into his rightful position was David just took a look at it and said, you know what, I dash you Ziba. Because what happens is the owner of the slave owns everything the slave owns. And that was how David um, restored Mephibosheth to everything. My brothers and my sisters, take a look. Just think the Bible. Every time a man isolates himself, he begins the, the downward um, spiral to something that never ends well. Have you not known people who were in church, they were fathers? Something happened and they left. And before you know what is happening, the next thing you hear, uh, they died. And you can't even explain it. I woke up this morning to the death of a pastor. Before I came to this service, I listened to one of the messages that man preached. And all of it started from... He wasn't isolated. I really don't know the gist of what happened. But the point is, God puts us in the environments of the body so that we never get in trouble. God puts us in families to save us from ourselves and save us from those who would exert on us. Do you understand this conversation that we're having today? 
we need to always remember we are put here for a reason. We are put here for a reason. And if you allow God to process you, you have something to contribute where you are put in. And you know, stop looking for someone to say thank you to you. If you are doing it for God, why does it concern you whether the pastor says thank you? Pastors, you too, be nice enough and say thank you. It's bad habit not to say please and thank you. So you should have learned that, that by now. Say please, say thank you. But if peradventure they do not do that, if God has plugged you in a place, make sure you give it your all. Make sure you give it your all. Make sure you give it your all. If someone asks a message, you say, how about when you try as much as you can, but somehow you feel like you don't belong there. I don't know how you people choose church, but I wouldn't just get up and go to a church because the building is nice. I will not just get up and go to a church because they say the pastor knows how to preach. I will not just get up and go to a church because they say, oh, their music is not. I really don't care for those things. They get to a point in your life that you go where you know you are being fed. If you belong in a house, you will know. And so, yes, you can get to a place and not feel like that place is yours. Did you pray? Did you ask God before you went there? Because if you asked him and you went there, you don't belong. It may be that it's your own inhibitions that are not allowing people um, embrace you. I tend to be very closed up. So if I come to a new place, I'm not the life of the party. You don't see me. I'm not the ya 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 kind of person. It will take me a while to open up to someone. So I will come and I will sit at the back every time until I find the comfort that I need to be able to mingle. Some people take more time to process a new environment than other people. And of course, I'm not saying that if you are being abused and they're doing stuff that does not glorify God that you can't leave. So this is not, they tied you there. They didn't bury your umbilical cord there. That's not the conversation we're having. I'm talking to people who willfully got up and decided that because of offense, they want to live where God has planted them. I remember the first time I, I preached this, somebody sent me a long message. And she said to me, I'm not isolating. I didn't even listen to her because I knew, she, I, I, I knew that. I knew that that was exactly what she was doing. She was working in isolation because she felt that she was um, entitled to something and someone else got the thing. But you see, when we're in the body, it's God that decides. Sometimes your pastor will come and push someone and it will look foolish. When my pastor ordained me, everybody was like this small girl. What is it about her? What does she know? She's rude. She's uncouth. She's this. When did she get married? Everything, the stacks, the odds were against me and they were stacked high. But my pastor said he heard God and he knew that I carried something. Even me that they were putting oil on my head did not know I carried something. But my pastor saw it. And he kept giving me assignments. He will say to me, you are the one that's going to preach on a Tuesday. I will come. And we fumbled through it. Then he will say, you are preaching on a Sunday. He kept helping me. He kept putting those responsibilities on me. And that's how I grew to the point that I am today. Someone heard the voice of God. So sometimes you may look like the most likely candidate because you have the natural inclination. But because the leader is listening to God, he picks someone that looks unlikely. Because God doesn't look at the outward appearance. You are not supposed to take offense. I'm not supposed to take offense. My point today, and it's a really short message, is that there are ways to pick where you need to be. For me, what do I look out for? Number one, I listen out to the voice of God. Is the voice of God there. That is assuming they did not expressly say to me, go to a place. Number two, when I go there, is the word Bible-based or is it motivational? Number three, because we all have the Spirit of God in us, does the Spirit of God in me bear witness to the Spirit in that place? Number four, and this is very critical, do they exhibit the fruit 
of the Holy Spirit. It's never supposed to be about the size or the affluence or the opulence. Some people go to church because they hear that a lot of young men go there and they have marriage age. So they go to the church where they think they will find husband. You've been there for six years. Now everybody's marrying. They've left you behind. Is, is that not telling you something? You cannot pick and choose where God will plug you. And wherever he will plug you, the, tendons, the, 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 the proper posture is to embrace where God sends us. Honestly, personally, I, I liked itinerant ministry. You know what that means? Ministry without agenda. Today I teach, tomorrow I don't feel like it. You won't see me again for the next two months. After I'm itinerant, I'm not supposed to be preaching every day. The last thing I wanted was to find myself in what I call organized church, where you have to have this, you have to have an organogram. Those things were not my cup of tea at all. I just wanted to do the work of God how best as I could do it. But when it was time and God thought it was necessary, he moved me to this place. I did a lot to confirm that this was where I should be. And this is where I am in this season. You know what's going to happen tomorrow? I don't know. If I wake up tomorrow and they say, don't go there again. I will tell all of you that they said I shouldn't come again. I will tell Pastor Val, okay, I'll see you next time. I'm serious. Because what's the point of going where you are not sent? What's the point of allowing offense to choke the sustenance of God out of your life? What's the point of saying, eh, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church? What does that even mean? You are the church, so if you don't go to church, you don't go to you. Have you thought about it? Isolation kills. Finally, every one of us, I've said it before, but I need to say it again. Has something to contribute on this journey. And so when you are supposed to be in a house, and because you don't like the face of somebody in that house you live, what you do is you take part of their sustenance and you take it away with you. They are going to ask you. Because you are called to feed people there. Now you are starving them. That's not good at all. That's not good at all. So the question again is, were you called to the place that you are at now? The place you left the last time, were you supposed to have left there? When we started the well, they heard it a lot from me. I used to always tell them, if they did not tell you to come here, better pack your thing and go back where you're supposed to go. Because what it will mean is that you would never grow here. You will never really become the fullness of who you are called to be in this place. Do not isolate yourself. There must be a believer that can ask you, why are you in that, on that street? Why did I see you in that car? When I used to run the youth fellowship, I told them, I said, if I see you, no should you. And I don't like the way I saw you. I will park and I'll begin to call your name. And you better walk up to me and just enter the car. Don't even ask me any questions. Just enter the car. Let me take you to your father and your mother. Because every time we are not accountable, every time we are not part of the body, then trouble is lurking. My brothers and my sisters, are you in isolation? Maybe you have already you are already in lockdown before the corona even told us to lock down. Where you are right now, is that where God told you to be? Are you isolating from your core? Are you isolating from the people that God has called you to bless and be a blessing to? And so that they can bless you too. Take two steps back and take a look at it. As long as you continue to isolate, you will begin to die. And death is in phases and in stages. There are a lot of living dead people on the streets, unfortunately. They are living dead. That's how I can call what I can call them. And we need to know that that's not the way God sets it up. You cannot go and minister to God and then come out and say, I'm by myself. 
say, how do you do church? You say, ah, you know, your verse will say it. It's just me and my God in my heart. What does that even mean? Did I not tell you that it's by their fruits? Or did the Bible not tell us that it's by their fruits that they shall be known? Isolation is the first step to destruction. It's when you isolate yourself, you open yourself to idleness. When you become idle, the devil will suggest things for you to do. Because you're not supposed, vacuums don't work in God. Make sure you are not isolated. That's why I always tell people, if you live in Lagos and you keep saying, I belong to the well, show up at the well, let's see you in the physical when we are there in the physical. But if you're just visiting the well online, don't tell me on Sunday, I didn't go to church because I will attend the well. If you woke up in your boyfriend's house, I don't know, it's your pastor that can know that one. If you stole somebody's phone, I can't tell because what you tell me on social media is what I can believe. We all need to be plugged in somewhere. That's why we are called the body. If you've been on this call this afternoon and you have not given your life to Jesus, your own isolation is raised to power 20. You need to give your life to Jesus. Because that's where we start from. So how about you pray this afternoon or this evening and say with me, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Because it's only in that place that God will begin to lead you to the places that you need to go. And it is in those places as you get there that God will begin to open your eyes to growth. Look at this girl that said, church had hurt me, I won't go there again. If I continued in that direction, only God knows where I'll be right now. Probably would not be married. I probably would not be in Christ anymore. The probability is really high, was really high. But see the decision of one man to say, you can't live under my roof and not go to church. See how it arranged my life and see where I am today. You can click on something and come and say, oh, I'm joining Commanding Your Money with BMM. Simply because someone stood their ground and said, it's not under my roof that you will not go there. Yes, I, when iron sharpens iron, it's not supposed to be fun. I imagine that it's a grinding against a grinding. Even the noise alone self tells you that it ought to be painful if iron could cry. Not to talk of when human beings who came from different places and different walks of life and with different permutations gather in one place. We are bound to rob each other off the wrong way. But if you would endure, that is how God sandpapers the nonsense out of us. My brothers and my sisters, whether church, physical church doesn't open in one year, we're not supposed to isolate. There must be someone that can say to you, stop, and you will be stopped. There must be someone that can say to you, that thing you're doing does not glorify God, and you will ring yourself in. Because where there is no accountability, trouble is about to come. Isolation is the first step to destruction. I want us to bow our heads and pray this afternoon. Talk to God. Talk to him. Tell him, if you are in a place of isolation and you like to talk about it, please send me a, an inbox message. This is heavy on my heart. We're not supposed to live without the impute of others. Christianity is a team sport. It is not a solo spot. It's a team spot. You are the hand, I'm the leg, this person is the mouth, another person is the eye. That's how it works. And sometimes the hand must tell the leg that the leg isn't doing it properly. That's how we build harmony. My prayer is that as you're praying and you're saying, Lord, give me the grace to remain in your body. May I not be caught out and may I not be locked out. That the Lord will begin to open your ears and your heart to the things that even we need to change in us so that others will come. And all of us in, on this call today are the body of Christ. So if I'm the one robbing you the wrong way, I apologize. And if you've ever been hurt, quote and unquote, by church before, that is the people in church. Can I just tender an apology on behalf of all of us? We're sorry we hurt you. We're sorry we made you leave your father's house. Please come back home. Please come back home. We are not perfect. We will keep doing our best. But please come back home. God forbid that it will be said it was because of us 
that you never made it. On behalf of the church universal, I'm saying today, we are sorry. Please forgive the church and please come back home. The prodigal son, the younger son left and the older son was so upset that when the younger son came back, the older son said, I'm not coming in. Perhaps you feel like your pastor knows someone is living in sin and your pastor is not doing anything about it. Please don't leave if that's where the Lord has planted you. Let the Lord work it all out in us. We are the body. And if we continue to have schisms and breaks, then what will happen is that a house divided itself against itself cannot stand. Will you receive my apology on behalf of the Church of Jesus Christ today? Please come back home. Your father is waiting with his, hands, his arms outstretched. He needs you to come back. And if you had an older son who went out, out in a huff because you don't think we know what we're doing, please come in and show us what to do. If we knew better, we probably would do better. Father Lord, my heart breaks today for those who are running around the street listless because they took offense and they left home. Because the, their desires pulled them out of your cover. Lord, today I'm praying for all of us, O oh God. Whether we left in body or we left by our spirits, Lord, that you will bring us back home. Amen. And that there will be a reconciliation and a unity in your house, O oh God. Amen. Because in Psalm 133, your word says that it is where there is unity that the blessing is commanded. Father, Lord, that miracles will begin to happen again in your house. Father, that healing will permeate every part of us in the name of Jesus. Lord, please hear our cry, O oh God. For as many as are outside and don't know how to come in, Father, Lord, shine the light in that darkness. May they find their way home. For those of us that are inside and have shut the, gates, the, the gate against our brothers and our sisters, Father, teach us how to open ourselves and the gates up out again so that they might come in. And Lord, when all of this is done, let your name be glorified. Let none be isolated anymore, O oh God. Father, Lord, fill us with your comfort. Teach us how to need and love each other. Let your love bind us together, O oh God. And Lord, let your name be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining today's broadcast. We'll see you again next Sunday, if Jesus starts.